He cared for over 10,000 orphans. Uh, He built over 100 schools that gave a Christian education to over 120,000 kids. And you've probably never heard of him. In the mid-1800s, in England, at a time where faith was hard to come by, there lived a pastor by the name of George Mueller. Now, George believed and prayed for God to do a miraculous work in England, something that only he could provide for in a way that only he would get the glory. So he began to pray. George felt led to start something new, to do something that would draw people back into faith in a God who answers prayer. So he wanted to build some orphanages and some schools for the many children who were under-resourced in his area. And although he knew it would take a tremendous amount of money, he never told anyone of his financial need. He never received any aid from the government. Over the course of his lifetime, George received and distributed 1.3 million pounds, which in today's currency is worth $150 million. Not bad for a guy who didn't know marketing and never solicited for funds. When he died at the age of 93, his worldly possessions were valued at $800. His treasure was in heaven. Uh, This week, we're in part two of our reset series. If you missed last week, we talked about what does it look like to reset physically, and so you can catch up with that on our YouTube page. Over the next couple weeks, we're going to talk about resetting spiritually and relationally, and today we're going to dive in to resetting financially. You probably don't know this about me, but I went to Virginia Tech and graduated with a business degree in finance. I heard in high school that Mick Jagger of the Rolling Stones was a finance major, and the Rolling Stones happened to be the highest paid band of all time, so I figured I can't lose. So I went to college, I majored in finance, I minored in music, and then I moved down to Nashville to become a poor musician. I think I was missing something to mix secret formula to success. I wasn't the kid who started a lawnmower business. I wasn't the kid who started a lemonade stand. I just always worked jobs and bought things as I knew I could pay for them. In fact, when I was a kid, I heard this phrase, remember this, uh, too often in our society, we buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't know. And that stuck with me. My first job was at a hamburger stand in Salem, Virginia. It's called Rally's. And I saved up enough money to buy my first car. You want to know what kind of car it was? No? Okay, cool. We'll move on. It was a 1986 Honda CRX. And yes, I painted it school bus yellow. And then in college, I worked three jobs over the summer, and I was able to come out of school without any loans. I was tired, but I was off to a good start. Now, you could say Sarah was smarter. My wife, she earned scholarships, and so she worked smarter. I worked harder. And by the grace of God, we were both able to come out of school debt-free. And as a newly married couple, in 2005, we began to talk about budgets, how we would spend our money, which has never in the history of marriage caused an argument, right? Right? So you've probably heard the phrase, failing to plan is planning to fail. And so my hope is that after today, uh, when it comes to how you're going to approach your finances in 2019, you're going to have a plan in place as we look at Jesus, as we look at what the Bible has to say. In fact, when you dive into Scripture, it's interesting. You notice the Bible has a lot to say about money. And when you look at the Gospels, Jesus has a lot to say about money money. In fact, in 16 of his 38 parables, he talks about resources, finances, and possessions. The great hymn writer and the founder of the Methodist church, John Wesley, he once said, earn all you can, save all you can, give all you can. Earn all you can says don't be lazy. Save all you can says don't be foolish. Give all you can says don't be selfish. When you look at what Scripture has to say about finances, much like our opening story about George Mueller, it always comes back to trust, wisdom, and the heart of generosity. And so while we could spend a great length of time on any one of those topics, today I want us to lean into what Jesus was trying to get into the hearts of the early church, this grace of giving. Jesus said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. He came not to be served but to serve others. And we all know that on the cross, he paid that ultimate price when he laid down his life, the greatest example of giving of all time. And we follow Christ's example of giving whenever we give of our time, our talents, and our treasures to others. Giving is where finances get fun. Giving is where you own your possessions and they don't own you. It's when you rule your bank account, it doesn't rule you. We're gonna look at 2 Corinthians chapter eight and Paul is writing to the early church 
about this grace of giving. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God also to us. So we urged Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. Now catch this. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love that we have kindled in you, see also that you excel in this grace of giving. If you're taking notes this morning, write this down. Uh, it's all from God, and it's all for God. We are stewards. You probably heard that, that term before, stewards. What is stewardship? Well, a biblical definition of stewardship is utilizing and managing all God's resources that he provides for the glory of God and for the betterment of his creation. And once we get that into our hearts, once we get stewardship into our hearts, we realize we can't give anything that he hasn't given us first. We don't give, we give back. I remember hearing as a kid in church this phrase, you've probably heard it before, if he can get it through you, he can get it to you. I love the term in this passage in Corinthians is the grace of giving, the grace of giving. There's an old acronym for the word grace. It's God's riches at Christ's expense. When you ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life, there's a bit of a transaction, if you will. He pays off our sin debt, and then through Christ, our balance is cleared. And then, this is the best part, he credits us with righteousness. So now, our spiritual account, so to say, is in the positive. 2 Corinthians 9.11 tells us why we've been given this grace. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion, and through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. We're blessed to be a blessing. So yes, listen to John Wesley. Earn all you can, save all you can, but don't just do that to raise your standard of living do it to raise your standard of giving. Uh, this week, I finished reading a copy of uh, Brad Forsman's book, I Like Giving. Love the book. Highly recommend you pick it up. You will be inspired, and you will be challenged. Again, that's called I Like Giving by Brad Forsma. Brad opens up his book with a story about a young woman named Tracy. Uh, Tracy was a single mom living on welfare, and on this particular Thanksgiving day, she was putting together a meal made up of canned food. She didn't have much. She was scraping what she did have together. When she hears a knock on the door, she goes and answers the door, and it's a man from the local grocery store with a full turkey dinner and all of the trimmings. She asked who it was from, and the man said it was donated anonymously. That moment changed Tracy because she realized that somebody out there cared about her situation. Tracy went on to get out of welfare. She got a job working as a nurse at a local hospital. Still, she had no idea where this mystery meal came from. Then it happened. Seven years after that Thanksgiving, Margot, a lady who was living in her apartment building, was admitted to the hospital in critical care. Uh, Margot was an elderly woman that had MS, and she didn't have long to live. The three days before she passed, she took her nurse Tracy's hand in hers and whispered, Happy Thanksgiving. From that moment on, Tracy was a changed person. She would go on any opportunity she had. She paid it forward however, whenever she was able to. It's amazing, isn't it? This passage in Corinthians talks about extreme poverty and overflowing joy. It seems like a juxtaposition, doesn't it? I mean, I don't think those two things necessarily go together. Most of us might be here uh, saying, I want to be generous. I want to live that way. I want to have those stories like we just heard about Tracy, but I just can't, I can't afford to be generous right now. And I want to tell you, you can't afford not to be generous. Give what you can, give where you can. In John chapter 6, we read this amazing miracle about Jesus feeding the 5,000. Right, you all have heard that miracle. He feeds 5,000 people on a mountaintop, and that's not even including women and children. Where did it all start? Well, it all started with a young boy who happened to have two fish and five loaves in his hand. 
That doesn't seem like a ton of resources. But when you put it into the hands of Jesus, he's able to multiply it. And he's able to do the miraculous. That was an investment that had some dividends, right? Give what you can. Generosity lives on a sliding scale. See, the church in Macedonia that Paul was referring to didn't let their extreme poverty keep them from giving. I'm reminded of a trip that we took to Guatemala in 2010. And uh, you don't realize what you have until you go to a place where they have next to nothing, right? And I've never seen the kind of generosity that we experienced on that trip. Uh, Sarah and I had dinner with a family, and it was one of the greatest meals I've ever had, not just because of how good it tasted, but because how much I knew it cost. And it was their joy to give. Uh, They wouldn't take no for an answer. According to World Bank, uh, nearly half of the world lives on less than $5 a day. Let that sink in for a moment. And yet, even in that extreme state, you'll find some of the most generous people you've ever met. Jesus found one of these people in Luke chapter 21. Verses one through four, it says, and he looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. And he also saw a certain poor widow putting in two mites. So he said, truly I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all. For all these out of their abundance have put in offerings for God. But she, out of her poverty, out of her poverty, put in all the livelihood that she had. If you're writing notes, take this down. Uh, Generosity is a trust issue. In Matthew 6, it says, where your money is, there your heart is. Jesus tells us you can't serve both God and money. Listen to me. Uh, When you live chasing after money, you're never going to have enough. When you live serving God, you realize he's always more than enough. Don't focus on provision. Focus on the God who provides and he'll take care of you. That's not my words, those are Jesus' words. Matthew 6, 33, one of my favorite verses in the Gospels. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. I'm no genius, uh, but all these things in this context means all these things. He's our provider. In fact, in the book of Genesis on Mount Moriah, God reveals himself to Abraham as Jehovah Jireh. It's one of the first names that God reveals himself as. It means the God who provides. There isn't a need he can't meet. There isn't a provision he can't provide. So be wise. Set a budget. I would encourage you. Set a budget for 2019. Be wise with what you have. Steward what you have well. But leave room for faith in that budget. See, when we set a budget and give all of our goals and dreams a plan according to what only we can make happen, I dare say sometimes we forfeit the opportunity for the miraculous to step in. Because when only God can accomplish something, only he gets the glory. So where do you put your trust today? In Matthew 19, Jesus has a conversation with a young man. This guy, uh, he had kept every law and would, would probably live what most of us would call a great life, a moral life. But Jesus Jesus always saw a little bit deeper. Verse 21, Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go sell all your possessions and give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. You see, money owned him. He had done everything right according to the book and yet his heart wasn't in the right place. He was chasing after the things of this world. Don't substitute the calling of the kingdom for the American dream. See, there's a a danger of entitlement when your drive to make money is simply to raise your standard of living. You're always after the next and the best. Uh, A bigger house, a better car, a newer phone. It goes on and on. And, And sometimes what happens is as you raise your quality of things, you lose your quality of life because it's a never ending pursuit unsatisfied, you lose your joy. Your greatest asset can become your greatest liability if you don't use it for God. The notorious B.I.G. said it well. Mo money, mo problems. Uh, In the Charles Dickens classic, A Christmas Carol, and I know what you're thinking, yes, I'm still stuck in Christmas mode, and yes, I did just watch this movie again. 
But in Charles Dickens' classic tale, A Christmas Carol, we meet this character, Ebenezer Scrooge. Now, you know the story. He's an old miser that pinches every penny. He never gives away to those who are in need. And then one night, he's visited by three ghosts, the Christmas past, present, and future. And he starts to view things in a bit of a different lens after those visits. He realizes that life isn't meant to be focused on yourself. His world changed when generosity overcame his greed. And what's interesting in the story is that at the very end, Ebenezer is still a very wealthy man, but here's the difference. His joy wasn't in his wealth. His joy is in what he did with it. Can I tell you that giving won't decrease your life. It'll only add to it. Winston Churchill said, you make a living by what you earn. You make a life by what you give. So if you're here, you're saying, okay, I want to live with a heart of generosity, but how? There's a couple ways to jump right into generosity. One is here on Sundays, and, and then one is throughout the week. Now, this isn't a tithing message, so don't hear me wrong, but catch this, because this is important. When you look throughout the Bible, you're going to see this principle of, of tithing from the book of Genesis on, where there was an offering of a tenth of whatever God blessed the people with to go back into the ministry, back into the storehouse. And in the last book of the Old Testament, we read Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. This is an invitation to God's blessing through tithing, because tithing is trusting. Trusting God to do more with 90% than we can do with 100%. Here's what it says in Malachi. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. God won't bless what you don't give. 10% is this tithing principle, and, and, and it's really just a baseline because Jesus goes on in the New Testament to talk about generosity, and trust me, he challenges us to go way beyond that. He goes after our heart, and when he has our heart, he has our treasure. One of my goals in life is to live reverse tithing where I give away 90% of what comes in and live off of 10%. I'm going to need to sell a lot more CDs before I get there. I'm a far way off from that. But that's a passion that Sarah and I share together. A tithing is a way to almost hardwire yourself for generosity. It's a, a great practice for us to get into a rhythm of giving. And as we say here every single weekend, it's your generosity as a church that empowers us as a whole to give back to our community. You should know this, that as a church, we actually give away 10% of whatever comes in to an organization that plants churches all across the world. And you're a part of that. Thank you. And this church is so generous. And we're blown away. Seriously. I just wanted to share a couple stories of what your generosity has already done, even in the young life of us being a church. Back in the summer, during our pre-launch season, we hadn't even launched yet as a church it was your generosity, giving of your time, your talent, and your treasure, along with our partner church in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, that helped us to do a, a backpack drive. I think we've got a picture or two of this. We gave away 500 backpacks filled with school supplies to kids in need. And I guarantee you, for those 500 kids, it changed their world, at least for a school year. And then this past Christmas season, you guys know this. We did a toy drive, and we were able to adopt a local school in Antioch and give them a Christmas. We set up a toy shop, and we, we, we told parents in the, that school, hey, come and shop for your kids for free. And it was your giving that let that happen. I think it was around 45 to 50 families that came, and they had a Christmas, some of them for the very first time. Thank you. Thank you for your generosity. The other way to live generously is to look for the opportunity everywhere you go. And there's a phrase throughout the book of Corinthians. It's this, ready to give, ready to give. And they were ready to give. Look for opportunities to give to those who least expect it. Give without any expectation of return. I would encourage you, maybe this week, start off your days asking God to highlight opportunities where you can give of yourself to bless someone else's life. This could be of your finances, of your time, of your talents, but look for ways to be a blessing to others. The great missionary Jim Elliott said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. This year, let's trust God with our finances. Let's be wise stewards about what he gives us. 
and let's excel in this grace of giving. Let's pray. God, we are so grateful uh, that your word not only gives us the incredible gospels, but there's so much wisdom packed from Genesis to Revelation in 66 books where you give us an incredible opportunity of life. And God, we know that we've been blessed not just to focus it all on ourselves, but to be a blessing to those around us. So God, I just pray over everybody in this room that this would be a year where they experience extravagant generosity, where they are a part of extravagant generosity. God, that our community, that our city would never be the same. It only takes one step of faith to ignite a movement. How amazing would it be, God, if we could ignite a movement of giving here in Nashville. So God, I just pray right now. There's people here, their heart is kind of in that butterfly mode. They're, 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 they're stirring with excitement because this is something they know they want to step into. God, I pray that you would let that dream become a reality this week. Highlight opportunities to give. God, let us be a blessing to this city. In Jesus' name.